This is the second of two videos talking about section 5.3. In this video, I'll be talking about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I mentioned this at the end of the last video, but the fundamental theorem of calculus part one says that the area functions that we were talking about in that video are antiderivatives of the original function f. And so when we're thinking about this, this just means the derivative of the area function a prime of x. This is the same thing, the derivative of the area function just written in the ddx notation. And this right here, that is the area function. So inside those brackets is a of x. So this is just saying the derivative of a of x in yet another way. And so what the fundamental theorem of calculus says is that the derivative of the area function, which I've written in three different ways, is equal to the original function that we started with, f of x. So why is the fundamental theorem true? Well, we need to go back to the definition of the derivative, right? So we don't really have a formula for what this area function is. Uh, if we know what the specific function f of x is, then we can derive a formula. We were doing that in some of the practice problems. But when we're trying to think of this theorem in general, why is it generally true that the area functions are antiderivatives of our original function? We need to think about, okay, what is a prime of x? And so this right here, this is the definition of the derivative. We haven't seen that in a while but that's what we started this semester talking about, definition of the derivative. So to try to understand what's going on here, what I've drawn here is my original function y equals f of t. So here's my t axis and my y axis. And then what I'm thinking about here is here's a, my starting point for my area. And then here we'll call that x, and here we'll call that x plus h. So we're starting with our x value, we're fudging it a little bit, we're moving it up just slightly to an x plus h, and we're thinking about what's the difference between the area uh, when I go from little a to x plus h minus the area when I go from little a to x. So that's going to be this little sliver here at the end. So this is going to be a of x plus h minus a of x, because this green part here, that's a of x, both areas combined, right, so if I go all the way around from here to here, this combined area, that is a of x plus h, right, when I'm going all the way to x plus h. So if I subtract them, then what I'm left with is a of x plus h minus a of x, which is that sliver right at the end. So let me get some of this stuff out of the way to make this a little easier to see. Okay, so that's the top of this fraction. So that sort of orangish peach toned slice of area there, that's the top of the fraction. Now what I want to think about is how can I think about what that little slice of area actually is? Remember, h is going to be going to zero. We're taking the limit as h goes to zero. So what we want to think about is what's going to happen as that slice gets skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. Well already we can kind of see that this slice almost looks like a rectangle, right? There's a little bit of error here, but this rectangle right here that I'm drawing has height f of x, because that's a vertical distance when I'm plugging in x, and the width of that rectangle is h. So the area here on top of this fraction is approximately the area of a rectangle with height f of x and base h. It's very similar to what we were doing when we did our Riemann sums. We said, well, we'll approximate the area using rectangles. And that approximation, just like with Riemann sums, that approximation gets better and better and better the skinnier and skinnier and skinnier these rectangles get. So what we have here is that a prime of x is approximately f of x times h divided by h, and that approximation is a better approximation the closer h gets to zero. And when I divide out the h's on the top and the bottom here, I just get f of x. So that's a rough explanation for why the fundamental theorem works, but it connects together the ideas from derivatives to this idea of area functions that we've been talking about. Okay, let's work through, th work through some examples. So we've got a formula for a of x, or we want a formula for a of x, which is the area from three to x of three t squared minus six t. This looks similar to problems that we've done before, but if I try to draw this graph and try to think about the shapes, they're not gonna be triangles and rectangles because three t squared minus six t is not a straight line, that's a parabola. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna use the fundamental theorem. So what we know is that we need an antiderivative of 3x squared minus 6x. Well, using what we know from previous discussions when we talked about antiderivatives, the antiderivative of 3x squared minus 6x 
that's going to be x cubed minus uh, 3x squared plus c. Now, what's c? We need to know an initial value for our function to be able to figure out what that c should be. Well, the only initial value that we're going to know here is that if I plug in 3, a of 3 is going to be the integral from 3 to 3 of 3t squared minus 6t, and that's definitely going to be 0. So if this is my a of x, then a of 3 is going to be 3 squared, sorry, 3 cubed minus 3 times 3 squared plus c. That's supposed to be 0. Now on the left hand side, 3, squ 3 cubed, that's 27. 3 times 3 squared, that's also 27. And that gives me c equaling 0. So my area function is x cubed minus 3x squared plus 0. So that's our area function. So we can use that initial value just like we talked about earlier with initial value problems. We can use that to figure out what c is. All right. So this time we're asking for the derivative of the integral from x to 5 of t squared plus 1, the square root of t squared plus 1 dt. Well, we're almost ready to use the fundamental theorem, but the problem is the fundamental theorem talks about area functions where the x is on the top and we've got a constant on the bottom. Well, we can fix that. We can flip this integral around and put the 5 on the bottom and the x on the top as long as we bring in a minus sign. So now if we want to know the derivative of that thing, the minus is a constant multiple of negative 1, so that's going to stick around by my constant multiple rule for derivatives. And then what's the derivative of this crazy thing? Well, the derivative of that crazy thing is just going to be the original function that we started with, and that's using the fundamental theorem. The fundamental theorem says the derivative of an area function, which is what I've drawn in that red box, is going to be just that function that we started with. So this is going to be the square root of x squared plus 1. Remember that the t there is just a placeholder. It's just a, a variable that we're using so that we don't have x in two different places. So that's going to be my derivative. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit. When we use our area function um, and we have any antiderivative, the tricky part is that we don't know what value to use for c. But one of the things that we can realize is that if we have any antiderivative, so let's let capital F be any antiderivative of little f. So we're not even saying anything about which value of c we're using. So if I take capital F of b minus capital F of a, and then capital A is my area function, so capital A might have a different c, right? So that, that might have a different plus c here. But the, the, what's going to happen here is that the c's are going to cancel out. So by subtracting f of b minus f of a, I'm saying, oh, I can cancel out those c's. What about capital A of little a? Well, this is like what we did in that example. Here's capital A of x. So this is going to be the integral from a to a of my little f of t dt. That's going to be 0. So the only thing that's going to survive, the c's are canceled out. Capital A of a, that's 0. So the only thing that is left over is capital A of b. But capital A of b, that's what I get when I plug b into my area function. So that's going to be my integral from a to b of f of t dt. So that's a quick little derivation. But what this gives us is what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. So this says that a definite integral from a to b, right? So we're not talking about area functions anymore. Now we're talking about a specific area from a starting point a to an ending point b. You can get that by taking any antiderivative. Remember, in the previous slide, capital F was any antiderivative. And so you just take the two values and then you subtract them. So this gives us a different way to use this connection between antiderivatives and areas. So for example, what if we wanted to know the area from x equals 1 to x equals 2 under the curve 6x cubed minus x plus 3? So what the fundamental theorem says is that we can take any antiderivative of this function. So let's see, 6 is going to be a constant multiple. Antiderivative of x cubed is going to be 1 4 x to the fourth. Antiderivative of x is going to be 1 half x squared. If I think of that as x to the first, use my power rule, add 1 to my power, divide by the new power, and then antiderivative of 3 is 3x. Three now, that fundamental theorem part 2 says that normally I get a plus c when I take an antiderivative, but I can use whichever antiderivative I want. So I can use the antiderivative with plus 17. But actually, to make my life easier, I'm going to use the antiderivative with a plus 0.
because if I can use whatever constant I want, I'm going to go ahead and use the easiest constant I can think of, which is zero. So in that case, I don't actually need the plus zero at all because I'm using the constant equaling zero. So now what do I need to do? I need to take this function, I need to plug in two, I need to plug in one, and then I need to subtract the results. That's what the fundamental theorem says. It says it's capital F of B, B is the upper bound, minus capital F of A, A is the lower bound. So because we're going to be doing this a lot, we've got a notation for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this function in brackets, and then after the brackets, we're going to put the 2 and the 1 as sort of upper and lower numbers there. That's just shorthand for what I've written there in text, which is plug in 2, plug in 1, and subtract the results. Okay, so 6 times a quarter, that's 3 halves, times 2 to the 4th, minus 1 half times 2 squared, plus 3 times 2. That's me plugging in 2, and then subtract from that, me plugging in 1. So 3 halves times 1 to the 4th, minus 1 half times 1 squared, plus 3 times 1. So watch out here. When you're doing these on your own, most important thing to watch out for, biggest mistake that I see a lot when I see these uh, students work through these, is this set of parentheses right here. So if you forget that set of parentheses, then you're gonna, the mistake you're going to be making is that this minus sign is going to only apply to that first term. And so you really need the brackets there, the, the parentheses there, so that you can subtract all that stuff. So work out what's inside the big parentheses first, and then do that subtraction that's in the middle there. Okay, so now all we have to do is just a little bit of arithmetic. So 3 halves times 2 to the 4th. 2 to the 4th is 16. 3 halves times 16 is 24. Half times 2 squared, that's 2. 3 times 2 is 6. 3 halves times 1, that's 3 halves, minus 1 half, plus 3. 24 minus 2 is 22, plus 6 is 28. And then 3 halves minus 1 half is 1, plus 3 is 4. 28 minus 4 is 24. So once we've taken the antiderivative, the rest is just plugging in and doing some arithmetic. All right, let's do one more. So this time we've given a graph. So we've got the graph of y equals 16 minus x squared. And they're asking us to find the area of the shaded region. So we can tell that that shaded region is a region that's between a function graph and the x-axis. So this is a definite integral. We just have to figure out which definite integral it is. Well, we can also see here that the graph crosses at the points negative 4, 0 and the point 4, 0. So those are going to be the starting and ending points for my integral. So my area is going to be the integral from negative 4 to positive 4 of this function, 16 minus x squared. So now we're going to use the fundamental theorem. Fundamental theorem says you take your antiderivative, so I'm going to get 16x minus 1 third x cubed. Because I'm using the fundamental theorem, I can use whichever antiderivative I want. I'm going to choose the antiderivative that has a constant of plus 0, so I don't have to write the plus c. And now I want to plug in 4 and negative 4 and subtract. Sometimes we leave off the starting bracket, so I'm not writing a bracket here. That We'll do that sometimes. Um, it's not actually required to have a balanced bracket there for this notation, so you may see that sometimes written in that way with just the closing bracket. But it means the same thing. So we're going to plug in 4, 16 times 4, minus 1 third times 4 cubed, and then minus, and again, these are the brackets that are really important, right? Make sure you have that second big set of parentheses. 16 times negative 4 minus 1 third times negative 4 cubed. All right, we're going to have a lot of negatives floating around, so we want to be really, really careful with that. Okay, 16 times 4 is 128. Just kidding, I meant 64. That pause you heard was me grabbing my calculator to make sure I didn't mess this up. So 4 cubed is 64, so that's 64 over 3. 16 times negative 4, that's going to be negative 64. And then minus one third times minus four cubes. So that's minus one third times minus 64. So like I said, lots of negatives. Got to be careful. All right, 64 is 192 over 3. So that's 192 over 3 minus 64 over 3. Minus minus 64 is plus 64. And 64 is 192 over 3. And then we've got a triple negative. So we've got this minus sign and this minus sign and this minus sign. So that's going to be minus 64 over 3. So 192 minus 64, that's 128. So I've got 128 over 3 
plus 128 over 3, that's 256 over 3. So again, you might have done that in a different way. Just throw that on your calculator and figure out what that is. So again, the arithmetic can be done in different ways. So that's it. So that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Again, we can use it in a bunch of different ways to find uh, formulas for area functions or to actually find values of area itself.